let's continue. So, um, so the decision rule that we have for LDA is called discriminant score. So this discriminant score is some delta k of x, and this discriminant score is what becomes linear in x. Uh, so it's equal to x times mu of k over sigma minus mu squared of k over sigma squared plus log of the prior. So the prior is probability of y being equal to k just in general. So as you can see, this is quite complicated. Uh, and if this seems complicated, you need to check the other equations for LDA. And then you will see that, all right, this is pretty simple, actually. Because this is linear in x. It's x, you know, length of fish times something minus some value. So the only thing is that this is linear in x. That's why we call it LDA. In, in QDA, the discriminant rule, if you write it, it's going to be quadratic in x. There's going to be some x squared that doesn't cancel out anymore. So this means that um, if we have the delta sub k of, of x, uh, let's say for all the values of k, um, then we, we can just use discriminant score. So let me just give you one example. So let's say that delta of salmon um, for input x, which is length of fish, is this. It's 20x minus, minus 10. And delta of tuna for input x is 30x minus, minus 20. All right. Now we have a fish. We just caught it and measured the length. Uh, the length was the length was 100. Now we want to know whether it's a salmon or a tuna. So this is just an example. So what we're going to do is to calculate delta for salmon and tuna, and then classify according to the class that has higher score. That's it. So for salmon, for input 100, we're going to get 100 times 20, so 2,000. Um, yeah, actually, let me change these values. All right, so 2,000 minus 1,000, so it's 1,000. That's the score. It doesn't need to be a probability or anything. Delta of tuna for input 100, it's going to be 3,000 minus 2,000. It's again 1,000. So what's going on here? Anyone? So the scores are equal. So when the scores are equal, it means that we are here. This is x, or length, and this is probability density. So what this means is that we are right here. This is length of 100. So length of 100 is equally likely to be a salmon or a tuna, because the density of the probability functions that we obtain from those estimates gives us the same value. And this value is kind of proportional to these delta values that we calculated, right? Now, if I ask you what is the, what is the p hat of y being, let's say, salmon, what do you think is the p hat? Anyone? A half, because based on the scores, we don't have any preference to classify it as salmon or tuna. Therefore, our predicted probability that a fish that is 100 centimeters is the probability is a half for either class. Any questions? All right. So this was just an example, but um, you know, essentially, this 20 comes from here, and this minus 1,000 comes from here. The 20 involves you know, the average of length of salmon divided by standard deviation. And this 1,000 includes the prior, just the fact that, let's say, uh, Salmons are twice as likely in, you know, in this region compared to tuna, right? That's probability 2 over 3, log of that, and then this term. But all of this kind of complicated formula boils down into some linear form. And when we have this linear form, we can just plug numbers and get scores and classify based on the class that has higher score. Um, yeah. So this, is just, this was just an example on LDA. So now let me tell you a bit more about this prior here. So prior uh, is the probability that generally something, regardless of its length, is a tuna. That's just the frequency of tuna compared to salmon in general. 
if we want to estimate this from a data set, what we need to do, all right, so we have the data set here, right? If, we, if this is the data set and we want to calculate the prior for y being, let's say, salmon, we need to check how many of those, these rows are salmon compared to total. Therefore, this is equal to n of salmon, number of data points referring to salmon over total n. That's how we estimate the prior. I guess estimating this one is also easy. Uh, for example, mu hat of salmon is going to be the average length of a salmon in our historical data. So what we're going to do is check these rows where y is salmon and check their, uh, check their x1, take the average of these values, right? So this is sum of, let's say, if this is mu1 of salmon, I can write salmon as a superscript, so mu1 superscript salmon means av we average x1 as long as y is salmon. And we divide it by number of salmon. So this is how mu is estimated. But when we use a statistical software package, it's going to take care of all of these for us. But it's just, I think, good to get an understanding of what these terms mean. You know? So these terms are going to first check uh, generally how common salmons are compared to tuna, because that has a relevance here, right, for our prediction. When this is larger, the log will be larger, and therefore the score will be generally larger, regardless of length. Um, and also for mu. So when mu is larger, um, this thing, the coefficient that you multiply to the length will be larger, right? Uh, and then this is maybe some correction term. Uh, all right, so that was an example on LDA. Um, okay, so actually I can use this one. So, so as LDA is linear, it's going to also give us boundaries that are linear. So let's say we have a scatter plot. Let's say we have a scatter plot with three types of data. So there are three classes. I'm representing. Some of the, so this is x1 and x2. Y is the type of marker. So I'm using square for one class. I'm using um, x's for another class. And using circles for a third class. All right, so the data is generated based on some data generation process with noise. Therefore, there is some actual boundary, some you know, optimal decision boundary that has created these data points. When these data points are linearly separable, it means that there is a way to, um, to find a couple of lines which perfectly separate these data points from each other. So here, these data points are not linearly separable because you know, I'm trying my best to create lines to separate them, but you can see I, I, I cannot add a line here, because if I add it here, these squares will be out. If I add it here, the circles will be out. So maybe the best linear um, kind of boundary that I can create will be something like, yeah, I guess, I guess something like this. So this data is non-linearly separable, which means the task of class clustering um, is challenging for us. The task of classification is challenging for us. Now what LDA does, LDA, as it is linear, is only capable of finding line boundaries. So these are the line boundaries that we get from LDA because it's linear. Therefore, regardless of you know, how good it fits the data, when the data is non-linearly separable, the accuracy cannot be 100%. So, but QDA, the advantage is that it's quadratic, so it can create curves for us. As it creates curves, so let's say this is, yeah, with LDA. With QDA, what happens is that maybe it can use the same thing here, same thing here, but for this last part, as it is quadratic, maybe it can create some, some quadratic boundary for us. And therefore, with QDA, there is a way to achieve 100% accuracy on this data set. So the data set is non-linearly separable. That's why we also need a non-linear model, like a quadratic model, at least. Later, we're going to learn about um, support vector machines. Um, that's, that's a method that allows us to find this separator in higher dimensions, and the separator can be a line in a higher dimension. Then it's easy to find it because finding lines are easy. And then after we find it, we bring everything back to the, to the dimension of data, and the line that we found up there is going to be some, maybe some complicated curvy shape in the dimension of the data. That's going to be even more um, 
capable and more, more sophisticated for dealing with nonlinearly separable data. And yeah, so that's, you know, that's the advantage of QDA over LDA, but uh, this advantage comes at a cost because with LDA, we need to estimate one of these for every class and uh, the variances, which are the diagonal entries of the covariance matrix are the same, so we just estimate them once. But with QDA, the variances are different across different uh, dimensions. Therefore, we, we just have more variables to estimate. And the number of these, estimate, these estimated variables, they do not scale with P. When P changes from five to 10, the number of calculations needed doesn't just double, maybe it becomes uh, 100 times more. All right, so back to this example, where was it? Let's just expand on this example. So we have the same discriminant function. We have the same discriminant function, but now let's say x is another value. x is 50. Or let's say x is, yeah, 50 I think was a good choice. So if a fish is 50 centimeters, delta of salmon becomes 20 times 50, 1,000 minus 1,000, zero. And delta of tuna is going to be 1,500 1, minus 2,000, so minus 500. Now my question for you is what is the estimated probability that this fish is salmon? So for estimating probabilities from discriminant scores, uh, this is the function. The function is actually very similar to logistic regression. So estimated probability using LDA um, is something like this, is e to the power of delta k over one plus, I guess, yeah, over sum of e to the power of delta i, where i is the number of classes, so from one to capital K. Therefore, for Salmon, what we need to estimate is e to the power of zero over e to the power of zero plus e to the power of minus 500. So I guess the result will be maybe 99% or something like that, because e to the power of minus 500 is something like a third to the power of 500. So one over three to the power of 500. So a really uh, small number. Therefore, this is going to be something like 0 0.99, maybe triple nines. So, and this is consistent with the plot that we had, right? Here, the estimated probability is that a fish that is just 50 centimeters, so I guess this much, is 0.999, likely to be a salmon compared to a tuna. Let's see. So when it, is, when it is 50, we get this likelihood here. But for tuna, this curve has kind of died down here. It's like almost impossible, right? That's why the relative kind of score we get from here compared to this one is going to be so large that the estimated probability will be 0 0.999. All right, so I'm going to just cover some topics from APS 1070 for those of you who have not passed that, that course yet. So so when we do classification, we have this concept of a confusion matrix. So let's say we're classifying, let's say we're using some model for, for detecting um, fraudulent transactions. So a fraud detection model. So we have predicted class and actual class. The predicted class could be uh, true or false, and the actual class can be also true or false. So, so here, when the actual class is true, predicted class is true, it means that the transaction was actually fraudulent and we correctly classified it as fraudulent. So this means, um, sorry, this is positive, positive, negative, positive, negative. So this is true positive, right? If something was not fraudulent, but we classified it as fraudulent, then it's a false positive, right? 
if something was actually fraudulent, but we classified it as valid, then it's false negative. And the remaining case is when something is not fraudulent and we do not flag it, so it's true negative. So from this table, one sort of analysis we can have is looking at the diagonal entry. The diagonal entry gives us TP plus TN over all the other, uh, which is all four of them together. This is accuracy. So now let me give you an example. Let's say we have a fraud detection. We have a fraud detection model, and we have true negative 85 and false positive 5. And two and three, four, or maybe. All right. Sorry, I changed the numbers again and again. I just want to tell a compelling story. So, this is pre actual class is in the columns, and predicted class is in the rows. So when we have a classifier like this, and we look at the accuracy, we see that accuracy is 90%. So initially, we get excited, right? Because our model predicts uh, is 90% of time correct in predicting something as fraudulent or as valid. But the thing is, for this model, if we look at precision, which is you know, how correct the model is when it flags something as fraudulent, we see that the precision is only 5 over 8. That's precision. So precision is 5 over 8, which is 5 times 12.5, right? So 62, right? Can you double check this number? 5 over 8 is 62, I guess, right? Sorry? Yeah, 62.5. Yeah, 5 times 12 and a half. So and this is still kind of, all right, not that bad. But what about this one? We can look at the recall. Recall means from the actual cases of fraud, so there were 20, 12 cases of fraud, and in total, we only detected five of them. So five over 12. This will be something around 40%. So despite that this model is 90% accurate, it's not really doing a good job, because its precision is small, relatively, and its recall is even less than 50%. Less than 50% means that from the cases that are relevant, so from the fraudulent transactions, it has only detected 40% of them. So there's another measurement, which is the fallout rate. The fallout rate for this model is pretty good because it's going to be false positive over some of this, which is 3 over 88. Um, so it's maybe something like 4% or less, right? So it's almost 3%. So you can see that the fallout is small. So What's happening here is that this model is not sufficiently sensitive for the application because the possible outcomes of this model are not, uh, are not really symmetric. You know, If there's a fraudulent transaction that we miss, that's quite a big deal. It means there's money moving between accounts while we cannot stop it. I mean, unauthorized money moving between accounts, and we, we do not stop it. That's really a big deal for fraud detection. But false positive is not really that big a deal. You know, it means actual credit card holder is using their card, but maybe at some unusual time of the day, or for some unusual transaction, or from some unusual IP. And the worst thing that happens is that we send them a push notification and only accept, approve the transaction if they actually verify it on their smartphone. So for this model, we can see that the fallout is low, which means that we can make the model more sensitive. So just to give you a recap of all these calculations, when we look at a row like this, this gives us the precision. And Recall is kind of orthogonal to that. This gives us recall. And I always think of false positive rate or, or fallout as some sort of a cousin of recall. So this is fallout. Fallout is false positive over some of these. Recall is true positive over some of these. Precision is true positive over some of these. So we have the ROC plot, which visualizes recall based on fallout. And for this model, you can see that the recall is 40%. So this is 1. This is 1. So this is the space of possibility for the ROC curve. But we are at 3% and 40%. So we are here. And an ROC curve is usually something like, something like this. 
ideally in an ROC curve, we want to be as close as possible to the top left corner because we want to have recall of one with a fallout of zero. That would be the perfect classifier. So here, our point is at 3% and 40%, but we can just change the threshold, making the model more sensitive, making the model more sensitive by just considering more transactions as fraudulent. And by doing that, we can move this point further up. Ideally, if we move it here, that would be a better threshold. So for the sake of binary classification, we're measuring some p hat, which is the probability of a fraudulent transaction. And we have a threshold for kind of stopping that transaction. So maybe the threshold is just a large number. Maybe only when the probability is more than 50%, we stop the transaction. What we can do is to stop the transaction even if the estimated probability is 30%. Then the model becomes more sensitive, and therefore, on the ROC curve, we get closer to the top left corner. So for those of you who were new to confusion matrix, it's uh, probably one of the top five most important things in machine learning, statistical learning, um, and any sort of predictive modeling. So um, make sure to check your textbook on this topic. And if you have any questions, just post them on Piazza. Um, yeah, so I think this example pretty much covers everything about confusion matrix. So also, if you check the Wikipedia page of confusion matrix, it's a much larger matrix with more formula. But what I covered in, in this example is what you need to know by heart for this course and any, I guess any other machine learning course. You need to know what precision is, how to calculate it, what recall is, how to calculate it, what fallout is, how to calculate it, what TP means, what FP means, all of these. Um, you know, sometimes this table is kind of rotated with actual classes in the rows, predicted classes in columns. That should not confuse you. Um, this is how I remember it. You know, I, I always draw the table myself and then check which one gives me precision. Then the orthogonal formula will be recalled. Then what is parallel to recall is fallout. And then re you need recall and fallout for the ROC curve. Um, yeah. And accuracy is diagonal, is the sum of the diagonal entries over all of them. Any questions? All right, so. All right, so now just a summary of the methods we discussed today. So today we talked about discriminant analysis, and there were three flavors of it that we learned, LDA, QDA, naive base, and we also covered logistic regression. So we learned about four methods today. Uh, logistic regression is pretty much the go-to method for binary classification. Whenever the outcome is one of two possible cases, logistic regression is the normal thing to do. Um, but logistic regression suffers from curse of dimensionality, meaning that when the p, when the value of predictors is large, uh, fitting a logistic regression model could be challenging. First, the computations is challenging, and also there could be collinearity between variables in the data set. Also, LDA and QDA suffer from curse of dimensionality. Therefore, when the number of features is large, these are not that easy to do. Naive Bayes uh, does a good job for predicting classes, but not for predicting the uh, probabilities. But it handles dimensionality better than the other ones, let's say. Uh, so I guess you know, whenever we have a classification task, if it is binary, this is logistic regression is a suitable choice. Um, as long as number of features is not large, then um, I guess when the number of features is large, we should either use logistic regression with regularization. So we have not covered regularization yet. Those of you who had APS 1070 with me, you may remember L1 norm and L2 norm, you know, some penalties that we would add to the objective function. That's essentially regularized fitting. This allows us to have a sparse model that only depends on a subset of the feature. So this takes care of subset selection for us as well, feature selection for us as well. Um, then the next thing we can do is naive base when P is large. If we only care about the classes, not the probabilities. I guess LDA and QDA um, are interesting from a mathematical perspective. Especially LDA gives us that discriminant score, which is very easy to use, right? This discriminant score, this is pretty convenient, I guess. And we, we also learned how to convert these discriminant scores into probabilities. So as long as we have the model, then using it is easy. So that's one advantage. And yeah, then later in the course, we're going to learn about more advanced models. And I guess when we learn about support vector machines, um, then it would be really unlikely that we use LDA or QDA in an actual you know, practical project. One other thing about logistic regression is that with logistic regression, we're estimating the odds, right? The odds where P of Y equals K over one minus P of Y, equal, y being equal to K. When, when, when um, this set of possibilities is just zero and one, just binary classification. So for binary classification, if the classes are well separated, actually the estimated parameters of logistic regression are going to be very unstable. This is because the denominator sometimes becomes zero Right? Because the odds goes to infinity, right? If you want to predict probability of something in a situation where something is much, much, much more likely than, than the opposite case, then logistic regression has unstable parameters. So that's another thing. So logistic regression 
is developed in medical sciences where it's really unusual to have clear separation of the classes. So the classes are, you know, a patient surviving or a patient not surviving, right? And there's, there are so many factors that goes to that. Therefore, there's no way that we have clear separation of the outcomes. That's why logistic regression is, is a common method in medical sciences, right? Because the outcomes could be binary, one of two possible outcomes, and the classes are so complicated that we're not going to have zero in the denominator. But in, let's say, engineering or physical sciences, where we might be estimating something that could be very, very likely, or something that is very, very unlikely, like prediction of fraud, right? So fraud is just a very unlikely outcome. Maybe out of a thousand, maybe out of a one million credit card transaction, perhaps only five of them are fraudulent, right? Because just, you know, committing fraud is not something that people do on an everyday basis, or some large number of people in the population do that. That's why maybe for fraud detection, if our data set is very unbalanced, logistic regression cannot be directly used on that data set because we're going to end up with denominators being zero. So in that case, one possibility is to just sample from the data set. So we, we can include all the fraudulent records, all the records representing a fraudulent transaction, and then maybe um, from the valid transaction, we only keep some of them. Then we're going to have a more balanced data set where instead of five over a million, the prior for fraud would be 20%, something like that. So that's, that's, a, um, that's a sampling method for making the data set more balanced. Any questions? All right, so, um, so there's some chance that next week we're going to have some guest speaker uh, who's going to um, talk to us uh, about more advanced scaling, more advanced scalable computing techniques. That's why I covered that today, so that next week, uh, hopefully, we will be ready for more advanced topics. Thank you very much, and see you next week.